now heard from our two speakers, and it's now time for contributions from you, the audience. We do have do we have a roving microphone? Or is it not going to be very it may not be very practical to get it to you, but please do wait for the microphone to come to you. Yes, gentlemen, there at the end of that panel. So if you raise your hand again to attend the mic. Hi, um, my name is Saeed uh, and I work in IT. Um, I've got a question to both speakers um, from a colleague of mine who doesn't believe in God. Um, the question to Hamza is, um, how much of a problem does uh, the theory of evolution pose to your belief in the existence of God? And the question to Rick, which is related, is to what extent uh, do you propose evolution forms the basis of an argument against the belief in God? Okay, we'll take a couple more. This gentleman just there. Um, uh, Hi, uh, my name is Asif. I'm a master's student here at LUC. Um, my question would be to Andreas. I'm wondering, you said there is no such thing as infinity, but aren't you contradicting the Islamic principle or this concept that after we die and once we go to heaven, we live there or, or hell, we live there for infinity? So, would you say you're contradicting one of the uh, basic uh, concepts of Islam here? Okay, uh, we have another one, two, three, what is the right at the back in the morning? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come to you in the next round. Okay, um, I'm Shabnam Ramsey. I'm a consultant, and my question is to, um, to both speakers. Um, as I understand it, um, Heisenberg's theory of uncertainty means that the ways in which we dialogue with the universe as observers affects the universe. So it seems to me that our ways of knowledge are totally in question. And I wonder what both speakers have to say about that in relation to the nature of God. Okay, so we've got three there. And then if you could wait with my microphone at the back, there are two more who are coming on next. So we've got evolution, infinity, and Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Heisenberg, would you... Uh, sorry. <laughs> 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 would, you, would you like to uh, ask all three in uh, 30 seconds? Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Heisenberg is more handsome than I am. <laughs> okay, in regards to evolution, it's very simple. In contrast to my argument, the evolution just has been said. It doesn't have a foot in the door. It's billions of years way after. Uh, because I was discussing about the initial conditions of the fine tuning of the Big Bang, and I was talking about the metaphysical principle of whatever begins to exist as a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore, uh, the universe has a cause. Now, with regards to evolution, even the prophet of neo atheism in his famous book, uh, The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins, he says, We don't have an equivalent explanation for physics. So there's a difference between the, a biological view on the origins of life and to do with the argument by design and the cosmological argument. So for me, evolution might be a very interesting way to explain the origins of life from a materialistic perspective, but I, I don't have to peg my arguments to that because my arguments are way before with regards to arguing for the existence of God. Now, with regards to predicting the concept of infinity, I will specifically say that the infinity doesn't exist in the real world, the universe as we know it. Concepts like paradise and hell are metaphysical claims and concepts that we only believe in from an epistemological perspective, how to get to know God and what God says via the Quran. There's, there's two differences between the real world and things such as things that we cannot even fathom. That's why the Quran is itself the light, the unseen, things that we cannot even know. We don't have the keys to this. So, from our analysis from the finite universe, we understand that the infinite, the infinite just doesn't have any ontological export into the real world. Some mathematicians said that it does exist, but that's based upon axioms and conventions that exist only in the mathematical realm of discourse. We can't export it to the real world, which, if you remember the examples I gave, will highlight this point. Uh, the third point, I think, is very interesting in terms of ways of knowledge. Uh, how we get to know things and how we get to acquire information. I think, for me, and I think this relates to Rick Lewis's very nuanced speech, is that we have to understand the difference between ontological arguments and epistemological arguments. Now, when I was talking about the existence of God, I was talking about a well-known, defined 
concept of God in terms of his ontological existence. He is a transcendental cause that has a personal, that has a personality, is a personal agent. Rick was going into the realm of epistemology, how we get to know God. And that's a totally different type of argument, in, in my opinion. Rather, the debate should be about, is the Qur'an from God, or how do we know if a book is from God, or how do we get to know God, which is a different type of question. And, and usually, when I had this debate at the American University of Beirut, and there was a shifting between ontology and epistemology, and we're going back and forward. Uh, but you know, I'm happy to address if we do discuss later about how we get to know God and what the nature of God is, including the problem of evil. But uh, with regards specific to this argument, there's a difference between an ontological argument and an epistemological one, how you get to know God. And for me, that would be the need and the necessity to prove that the Qur'an cannot be explained naturalistically. And that's how I leave it as that. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Right, over to you, Rick. Um, so, evolution and Heisenberg are compulsory questions for you, but infinity is optional. <laughs> okay, well, uh, evolution, I think I, I probably largely agree with uh, Hansa on this one. Um, I think before um, Darwin came along, uh, the existence of, of, of such complicated, subtle uh, organisms as ourselves and, and the other animal and plant life on the planet actually was a pretty powerful argument for the existence of God. And I think that uh, uh, Darwin's theory, by, by providing a very compelling alternative explanation of that, removed that argument for the existence of God. Um, however, that doesn't mean that uh, the theory of evolution uh, therefore means that there is no God of another sort. It, 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 it isn't an argument against the kind of God um, who, who, who simply sets the universe running and then leaves it alone, for instance. Um, so, uh, yes, um, uh, evolution is an argument against certain conceptions of God, but, uh, but perhaps not against the, con the conceptions of God that we've been mainly discussing here. Um, uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, yeah. Um, it's utterly fascinating, of course, and very significant that uh, um, there are some things we can't know, even in principle, um, about uh, subatomic particles, the fact that we can't know both the position and the momentum of a particle at the same time, uh, for instance. So there's a limit on our knowledge there. Um, um, uh, certainly this is a question about what we can know, um, but uh, um, uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't mean we can't know anything about anything uh, in the physical world, of course, uh, because once you get above the subatomic uh, uh, level, um, uh, the statistics of, of, the, of the, the movements of particles and so on, as far as I understand it, um, uh, are sufficiently reliable that we can um, um, say things with confidence about the position of, of chairs, um, uh, lecture rooms, planets, uh, each other, uh, and, and so on. Um, so in, in some sense it does provide a, a problem about knowledge, but, uh, but uh, not such a problem that it, that it undermines all our uh, attempts to gain knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll take some more comments. There's a gentleman right in the back corner there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rahim. I'm a social worker. Um, could I ask both of our speakers for their views on the idea that without a, an objective force of some sort, there is ultimately no right and wrong unless you have something that is external to our subjective experience, right and wrong is purely defined by our time and our culture and our place. Thank you. Thank you. And then the uh, lady in white just in front, I think, had a comment. Um, this question is from a colleague of mine. Um, he's wondering that if God created the universe, then who created God? <laughs> yes, and uh, we have another one. Uh, There's a gentleman right at the back there. Um, hi, Rick. Uh, this is a question for you, Rick. Here, um, I, I totally endorse the. Uh, my name is Farhad. Um, I study physics and philosophy, um, and uh, that was my background. My question for you is that I totally endorse the fact that um, physicists have a very strong point when they say that. Um, if we can, if physics can explain the phenomenon of earthquake, then why do we need a second explanation? Right. I mean, that's that's a good question. Um, that's assuming <laughs> that is a very good question. I mean, I mean, but that's assuming that 
physics does explain everything, both in all the realms that we, have, we, we need to know about. Um, but my question is that why is it, why is it that you have, why is it that you are creating a fundamental problem with basic concepts which could explain phenomena and we do need them to support the general theories. For instance, taking physics, we can't falsify the concept of force. We can't falsify the concept of energy. We say that energy created, say, quarks, but then we find out that more well, well quarks in subquarks, and then we say energy created subquarks. And those those arguments are so basic and so fundamental to the understanding of physics, if you, if you rip that apart, it's more fundamental in time space that if you rip them apart, you are left, you, you're practically left with nothing. But we need them, but we use them to bring about a consistent understanding of the physical universe. Now, if that argument you assume can be extended to the ontological world, if I, on the other hand, come, and, and, I, and, I, and I accept that energy exists to an extent, I don't have to, but I do. Um, but if I, um, take this very argument to the level of God in the sense that how we Muslim describe it to be and can bring about a very consistent understanding of, 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 um, of many questions that you ask that might not satisfy your feelings but will give us the ability to distinguish between the right and wrong questions which is the very thing that, that knowledge is meant to do then what is the problem with that? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll invite Rick to go first on these three. Okay. Um, Three difficult questions. Um, firstly, uh, the question of um, um, uh, whether we need some external, something external to us to show us uh, right and wrong. I, I think broadly that was the question. Um, um, there's two, two halves to my answer. Um, firstly, I'm not sure that uh, the existence of a God would necessarily enable us to know right and wrong, although that is, of course, a popular view. Um, but it's a, a view which has been criticized uh, right back as far as uh, Plato um, in his uh, uh, Euthyphro um, dialogue. Um, uh, well, he asked, uh, is an act good because God commands it? Or does God command an act because it is good? Um, if an act is good solely because God commands it, then we're committed to uh, saying, well, whatever God commands is good, even if he commands something completely uh, awful. Um, on the other hand, if God commands things because they're good, then we don't need God as a source of our morality because there's some other source of morality which God himself is conforming to. Um, if there isn't a God as a source of our morality, then I don't think that's an insurmountable problem. It doesn't mean we can just do whatever we like. Um, and uh, uh, of course the whole of moral philosophy is, is a series of attempts to uh, explore uh, how we should behave. Most of those attempts don't rely on the existence of a God. Um, and some of those attempts are more successful than others but there's been a lot of exploration of this. How should we behave? Here we are, supposing, supposing there's no God. Here we are, we've, we've, we've got to find some way to get on with one another and to, to run our society. Um, imagine two different ways of doing this. Imagine two countries next to each other. Neither of them has a, a widespread belief in God. In one of those countries, the general view is, well, do whatever you feel like. Um, do whatever suits you at the spur of the moment. And it's, it's a place where people lie and cheat habitually, they, they stab one another in the back. Um, it's, it's like the Wild West, but worse. Um, uh, uh, and uh, there's, there's never any peace for a, for a moment because everyone does what seems to be in their immediate advantage with, with no concern about morality. And in the neighboring country, um, People do observe some sort of moral code, um, whether uh, one uh, based on uh, tradition and custom. After all, the word morality comes from mores, the Latin meaning custom. And the word ethics comes from the Greek ethos meaning custom. Um, so uh, they have either a morality based on, on custom or else they have some moral code which they've just agreed among themselves. This, look, this is how we treat one another. Is this all right, everybody? 
Okay. Now, which of those two countries would you would you rather live in? Which of those countries would you rather raise a family in? Um, I know which one I'd rather live in, and I think that maybe is all the basis you need uh, in secular terms to to for for for, uh, for morality. Uh, sorry, I've gone on a bit with that one. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, who created God? Um, that's a, a very difficult question, pr probably a one that I should leave to... to uh, um, <laughs> 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 I'm going to dive out of the way of that one. Um, okay, sorry, do you want to check? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hamza, a challenge for you. <laughs> Thank you, that's very interesting. <clears throat> Now, firstly, about objective morality is a very good question. Now, again, well, if you listen to what Rick Lewis was saying, it was an epistemological. How do we get to know what morality is? That wasn't the question. The question is the basis for morality, the, the ontological status of morality, if you like. And I would argue, if God does not exist, then objective morals do not exist. But since objective morality does exist, therefore God exists. I'll give you an example. Say, we take God out of the question, because God by concept is the only conceptual anchor that transcends human subjectivity. What else is there? If you take God out of the question, we cannot really say rape is 100% objectively morally wrong from a conceptual basis. It doesn't mean atheists do bad things. No, atheists are great people. We're talking about... <laughs> that wasn't meant to be a joke, by the way. <laughs> So the point I'm trying to make is this, in absence of that conceptual anchor that transcends human subjectivity, you just have two things, social pressure, like what Rick Lewis was saying, and evolution or biology. Now if you look at biology, we're just accidental byproducts of a lengthy evolutionary process. Our morals have evolved just like our ears or our teeth, and in evolution we're just animals, and animals don't have a moral paradigm. When you see a lion ripping the neck of a deer and drinking its blood, you don't say, hey, that lion's acting morally. No, you say it's according to his instincts. So surely we can't have evolution which is ever changing as an objective basis for morality. So what's left? Social pressure. I would argue if you read anything about social history, social constructionism, read a very basic book by Vivian Burr called An Introduction to Social Constructionism, we can easily come to the conclusion that this is dangerous ground. Because that was an excuse, what happened in the 1940s against the Jewish minorities. There was a social consensus that it was okay to say that we can kill the Jews, which we all believe is objectively morally wrong. But we can only really believe that if you believe in a God. Because what else is there as a conceptual anchor that transcends human subjectivity? We're stuck. Now Rick Lewis talked about Plato's dilemma. The way to break that dilemma is this. It's because God is good. And that's how you break the dilemma. So the second question, who created God? I really love this question. <laughs> now, with regards to the design argument, it would be who designed the designer. Now, in the philosophy of science, the best explanation doesn't require an explanation. For example, if I'm 500 years away, we go and we're archaeologists, say. Futuristic archaeologists. I don't know what they're going to look like. Uh, and we go into a park, Hyde Park in London. And we start to dig, and we see my mobile phone, a bit of cable, a bit of camera. Now surely the most rational explanation, the best explanation is to say, there was a civilization here. Now if a skeptic comes along and says, well, I don't think that's true because how did they exist? Who put them there? Where did they come from? What was their color? Those questions doesn't negate the first explanation, which is the best explanation. doesn't require an explanation. Because if we continue to do that, it's self-defeating. We will not even have science to explain the explanation, to explain the explanation of the explanation ad infinitum. <laughs> then we won't have any knowledge. Then me and Rick should just go home. <laughs> so, and the second point is, with regards to who created a creator. Now, if you define from a logical perspective a creator is an uncaused cause, then you're saying, who caused the uncaused cause? It's like saying, my friend John is in hospital and he delivered twins. What are the gender? I want an answer. <laughs> what are the gender? It have Sorry? It can't have it. Exactly the question. This is nonsensical. It just doesn't apply. That's exactly the point. And obviously from the cosmological argument, I said no whatever exists has a cause. 
But whatever begins to exist, God never began to exist. Now, with the third argument about falsification, uh, the brother, I think his name is Fahad, he, an amazing argument. I really like this argument because I could have just got onto the podium and said, I believe in God because it's intuitive. It's inside me, I can feel it. And that's a rational argument. Do you know why? Because there's a consensus almost in humanity. Anthropologically, sociologically, there's many anthropologists now saying if you put kids on a desert island, they're going to believe in a God. So it's intuitive. Similarly, why should I prove my intuitive claims? Science never proves or justifies that the external world exists. It's an assumption. They never question that assumption. Do you know why? They don't have an answer. They have to start somewhere. So if they claim God is irrational because it's intuitive, well, science is irrational because it's also based on something intuitive which the external world exists. So it's a very basic philosophical premise that we believe that God exists from intuition. Although I didn't use that as an argument, but you can do. And if anyone says to you, well, you shouldn't believe that because it's irrational, well, that goes with any type of philosophy. Every philosophy has an assumption. The assumption of science is that the external world exists and they just take it for granted. Just like we take God for granted. Simple as that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. we've, got, uh, we've got time for another round of three questions. Where's the microphone? If you could, the first one, the lady in red says, so if you go up to row six and then across five places. My question is going to be a bit controversial because I'm going to ask about something that it hasn't been addressed so far. We talk about God and in my understanding is when we talk about God, sometimes we might relinquish our responsibility. I was brought up in a Roman Catholic religion, but then I also explored the Buddhism and the Eastern religion and I think maybe the God is between us, but I wouldn't want to give the name God. It's about if we start listening to ourselves, we get in touch with nature around us, we get in touch with uh, uh, people around us. You know, there is the, the, the lion that kills another animal. There is that part between us. And a lot of religion are, lot, sorry, a lot of the wars happen because of this fight about God. So I think this, the, the also the, the people who don't believe in God, the, what we attach to God, that should have a space and a voice in, in this setup. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then next one, I saw the gentleman in the second row, right at the end of the row. Thank you. Uh, well, my question to Brother Hamza is, uh, I totally understand the difference between the nature of God and the argument which was supposed to be here, that whether the God exists or not. Uh, but what I have seen from uh, Professor Rick is, uh, to most of the arguments you have raised, he has answered, maybe coincidence has to be this way. So, uh, but the initially he raised an argument about the evil, uh, how do you explain evil if God exists? So because he has gone away from the track, I would like to ask you to answer this question as well if possible. Okay, thank you. And there were lots of bids for the last slot. Um, <laughs> can I take a gentleman here in the middle, please? Uh, my question is to the second speaker. You said that the universe came out of nothing. My question is who created nothing? <laughs> yes, nothing is a, a challenging concept, and nobody knows what to do with it, but then he would. <laughs> right, Hamza, over to you. Thank you. Okay, um, I think if I want to sum up the first question, which is a very interesting question, I think it's in two types, two forms of that question. The first form is, how do we get to know God? The second form is, religion and war and disasters. Now, I would argue that in order to know God, we can't really just rely on introspection because we are based on different genetics, social structure, demographics, historical geographical background, heritage, etc. 
and we would have our own conceptions of God, which would be problematic. And we've seen that in history when there wasn't much religion around that actually defined and bring people to a consensus on what God actually is. So if we do rely on just introspection, I think it's problematic because we're trying to understand this transcendental cause that is, has, is a personal agent that created the whole universe. How can we do that? All we know is there's a knocking on the door. We don't know who's behind the door unless it tells us. So the knowledge has to come externally, not introspectively. And I believe that knowledge is the Qur'an because of other evidences such as the miracle of the Qur'an. Now with regards to religions and war, this has been used by the neo-atheists, um, dogmatic neo-atheists in my opinion, such as Hitchens and Dawkins. Uh, they say religion causes war, it's barbaric, it's not good for your life, it's rubbish. Now I give a simple answer to that. The simple answer is, in the secular history that we know of today, it has been the most bloodiest history on humanity. And it wasn't in the name of religion, it was name on, on, in the name of secular ideologies. Uh, even if you want to point the finger, look at Stalin, killed six million Christians, Pol Pot and others who did things in the name, not of religion, but of other ideologies. Similarly, when they say religion is not good for you, I think that's wrong. That's based on a media hype, a misconception. Something based upon the oppression of the historical Catholic Church using the coercive arm of the state to stop anything that was in Congress with its teachings. Hence the Protestant tradition, and we had the 30-year wars, the 80-year wars, the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day. It was a mess. Christian, Christian history, it was this, you're drowning in blood. That's why you had the liberal movement, you had the individualist doctrine of rights, etc. But when we look at today's reality on religiosity and religion, there's been st studies by sociologists that are pointing, to, pointing the finger to something very positive. Positive correlation between those who believe in a religion to have less sickness, to be healthier, to live happier lives. And some statistics here, for example, just to mention a few. In 2002, Brian Johnson and his colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, Center of Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society, reviewed approximately 500 studies that had been published in peer-reviewed journals. And they concluded that a large majority of studies showed positive correlation between religious commitment and high levels of perceived well-being, self-esteem, low levels of hypertension, depression, and criminal de delinquency. I had to call my grand and tell her to be, to be religious. It will lower her hypertension. <laughs> Do you see the point? <laughs> Similarly, in the Handbook of Religion, the, there's many books called The Sociology of Religion, and they don't inquire about the intellectual nature of religion, if it has a basis or not. It says, how does it affect our lives? And statistically, you're more likely to be happy and healthier as someone who believes in religion than someone who does not. Now, I leave the third question to yourself, Rick Lewis. <laughs> thank you. There you go, Rick. Okay, thank you. Um, Yes, um, the, the question about the knowledge of God. Um, uh, Hamza said uh, a little earlier um, that uh, there's almost a consensus on, 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 on God. If you put people on a desert island, then they'll develop a religion. Uh, and uh, he also said later that, uh, um, well, okay, what we have is a knocking on the door. And uh, you know, how we interpret that in, 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 in terms of religion, how we find out about God is, 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 is a huge question. Uh, but. Um, I would say that there's no knocking on the door, and uh, although there is a consensus, it's not a consensus necessarily on um, uh, the existence of some kind of God, although it obviously is a very widely uh, held opinion. But it's, it's well, what, what is really universal is, is a, uh, actually a need for, for answers to fundamental questions. And the, the, the most popular answers to those questions historically have been religious answers, but they're not the only possible answers. Um, so, um, secondly, the, the, the question about uh, religion and war and evil and so on, um, I think uh, terrible, awful things have been done in the names of religions and in the, under the inspiration of, of, of religions, um, and also good things as well. And uh, among humanists, you, you get, if you look at history, you, you've got terrible, awful atheists like Stalin and, and also uh, good humanists and, and uh, good atheists as well. Um, um, uh, 
given the, the, the vast number of, uh, the vast section of humanity which is religious, it's hardly surprising that uh, religious uh, people across uh, history and across the world uh, display the, the whole range of, of human behaviors from the very bad to the very good. And uh, uh, whether uh, religion makes people overall better or not is a difficult question to answer. Maybe it makes them better overall. None of these things, none of these things affect the truth of whether or not there's a God. Um, it, that's a separate question altogether. Um, uh, lastly, the question about who created nothing. Um, well, I suppose nothing is the one thing that doesn't need creating. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll, we'll take another round of questions. Uh, where's, where's the microphone? Okay. Um, gentlemen, just say Uh, this question is to Rick. Um, I thought about it actually when you spoke about... I, I was thinking about what you said earlier in terms of is God exists and you know the proof of it. And actually start thinking about the whole issue about Mac faces window, who has more virus. And, and the reason I thought about that is that it's one of those answers that you don't know until you sort of try kind of thing. Um, you also talk about a lot of things about nothing, you know, universe actually sort of happened and that's all to it. Mm -hmm. If I take your argument sort of the way I, I understand an example is I took a, a piece of program code that's written in window and I put on a Mac machine. It's not going to do nothing. It's, not, it's, it's absolutely not going to do nothing. So for me I find difficult so many people to be here today, walking, seeing and hearing and actually uh, to be said that you are from nothing. It's just sort of out of my imagination. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a few right at the back. If you could go up to the back on the on your right hand side. Yes. Gentleman who's standing up there at the end of the row first. Hi there. Uh, my name's Rob Gifford. Um, I'm coming at this from a Christian point of view. I'm a Christian and I came, uh, if you're looking at it from a Christian point of view, <laughs> obviously I would say this, it seems simpler. It's based on revelation. If you want to know what the Christian God is like, look at, look at Jesus, who is God in human form. When I came, I was expecting, um, I was expecting the, uh, Hamza, you to talk more about revelation. Since I was under, I, would, I thought that Islam was more of a, a like, in some ways similar to Christianity, a, a religion of revelation. And I wondered, you've talked a lot philosophically and ontologically and epistemologically, whatever. Um, I'd like to ask about the concept of revelation in Islam, which is very much at the heart of the Christian faith. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, Rick then what, I, do you re, are you really saying that you see no evidence of design or of a, of a mind behind created order? Okay. Uh, thank you. Could you take uh, a gentleman, some, what, 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 one of those, one of the gentlemen up there, please. Okay. Um, Rick, yeah, you said, um, when you look at all the uh, bad things and evil things in the world, that you know, obviously God doesn't exist and all this kind of stuff, yeah? But, let me tell you something about myself, yeah? When I was little, and my, and my mom, she hit me when I did something bad, right? I didn't turn to her and say, you know what, you don't exist, mom. <laughs> in fact, when my mom hit me, I knew she existed. <laughs> so, Okay, thank, thank you. Um, actually, could we, could we just take one, yes. one more? Uh, just one question. Just take, just take three, yes. yeah, my name is Claude. I'm a child of the universe. Just a basic question to, towards the panel. Um, if God is the beginning, and God is the end, and God knew that when he created man, he gave him the ability to choose right and wrong, why did he create Adolf Hitler? Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll take those and then we'll probably have one more round. Um. Okay, I think the gentleman uh, 
in the front low, front row rather, and he's quite low obviously compared to the rest, um, is that I agree with him. There are greater reasons to believe that God does exist. And some of the reasons I elucidated today, which is the cosmological argument and the argument by design, which I believe some of the responses that Rick gave, I don't think they were counted philosophically as defeaters. There may be some questions, but I don't think they're defeaters. For example, one of the questions was about causality that is pegged on time. I say no, because my first premise of whatever begins to exist as a cause wasn't a physical claim, it was a metaphysical claim. So there is responses to these questions, but the reason I didn't want to dwell too much into them because we could be talking about just one issue rather than many. Um, so I do still believe that there was no adequate response to the premises that I gave today in today's debate. The second question about revelation, this is a fantastic question. Now, I would argue that the difference between Islam and Christianity from my perspective is that Islam doesn't require you to believe in a book just based on blind faith. Uh, for example, I have many discussions with intellectual Christians and they say, well, the, the Bible is from God because it says so. I say, but how do you know? Then he says, the Bible is from God because it says so. And then we go into this kind of circular argument. And the way they break the argument, they say, well, you have to break the circle by just allowing Jesus to enter into your heart. And I say, well, what if you don't believe in Jesus in the first place? <laughs> so there's a problem. So the reason... I start off by using philosophical arguments. To be honest, I supported them by two revelations, two verses from the Quran, which summed up the argument itself anyway. But the reason I don't bring revelation to play, because that's epistemology, but I do also believe that the Quran can be a proof for God. Because the Quran, in my opinion, is a miracle. Now, when I say a miracle, I don't say it goes outside of what we perceive to be natural law. Because natural law, is what? It's not like something that is, is gospel truth. Sorry for the pun, I didn't mean it that way. Yeah. But what, what I'm trying to say is, is that natural law is just patterns that we perceive in the universe. Now if something changes the pattern, it goes against the pattern, it doesn't make it a miracle. That's incoherent view on miracles. I believe in the Islamic philosophical perspective of miracle, which is basically an act of impossibility. Or in more detailed words, an event that lies outside the productive capacity of nature. And the Qur'an is that. For example, it's a linguistic miracle. It jumps outside of the nature of the linguistic miracle, which is Arabic itself. So when we go to the Arabic language, which is based on a finite set of tools, grammar, words, letters, and we exhaust all possibilities, all combinations, we cannot create the unique literary form of the Qur'an. So it's an event that lies outside the productive capacity of nature. And it logically follows that it's a miracle, which proves the need for a supernatural agent here. I know it's quite philosophical, but I can't sum up a whole debate in a few seconds. Now, the last point about the problem of evil. I would disagree with the gentleman because if your mom slapped you, it could be because she, she wants best for you or she could be bad. And we can't attribute badness to God. So the way I would personally deal with the problem of evil is that, first and foremost, to believe that evil really, really exists, you need God in the first place. So how can you construct an argument which for the basis of the argument is God but the argument negates God it doesn't make any sense you see so that way what you do you actually explain God's existence and the existence of evil but you don't have to really explain why but I would also introduce here that the concept of problem of evil that he was coming out with which logically follows as this one a good God exists that is omnipotent two evil exists three Therefore, a good God that's omnipotent doesn't really exist. But that's based on a very Christian limited understanding of God. God is just love, just good. That's the problem. I would even argue, if God was just love, sometimes I don't see it. If God is just good, well, I don't see that all the time either. I mean, spend half an hour in my Greek family, you realize this very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Spiros, my brothers in the audience, and my sister and her partner. Anyway, the point is this, is that Islam, I believe the concept of God in Islam is amazing. That alone has made people embrace its philosophy, its teachings, and its way of life. Because we believe God is not just good, not all just good, not all compassionate and all loving, but He's also the one that's all wise, and the one that also punishes, and the one, so many different other, other names and attributes that we believe who God is. And we could then easily reconcile who God is with what's happening in nature. 
For example, wisdom itself. If we believe God is all wise, but we can't see the wisdom, it's a logical fallacy to claim, well, I can't see the wisdom. Because I've been arguing from ignorance, and you can't argue from ignorance. So the point is, we can easily reconcile God's names and attributes to what's happening in the world. For example, the tsunami. The children that died in the tsunami, we don't have a very atheistic, bleak view on life. That's it. Dead, suffering, tortured. Oh my God. They don't believe in a God in the first place. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is this. Is that for the Muslim, for the Muslim, we believe this child is actually in eternal bliss now. Who thinks that's more of a better way of the world view? That the child's in eternal bliss rather than it lived a life, it's just matter and biology and just evolution. And if it's just matter, then it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> so, the, so the point I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make is, even from an emotional point of view, what would you prefer? A view on life which would have no injustice, no end bliss? Or just a view on life that you're always going to complain and you're going to have problems and you're going to see in a very negative perspective. I believe the Quranic worldview, in contrast to the atheistic, agnostic and Christian worldview, is slightly more positive because we have a great understanding on who God is, which we can prove via the Quran. And who God is, such as all wise, all knowing, all loving, is easily reconcilable with the problem of evil, which inherently is a problem with Christianity, no other religions such as Islam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, there's a lot of interesting questions there. Um, uh, I'm going to try and take the first two together. And uh, someone asked if I really thought that everything could come from nothing, all the, the wonderful things we see around us. And uh, the gentleman who asked about uh, Revelation said, uh, did I really see no evidence of design behind uh, uh, created uh, order? Um, And uh, the answer is, I, I think, I, I, no, I don't see uh, unequivocal evidence of, uh, of uh, design uh, in the world. Um, and uh, at this point, I am going to call on theory of evolution after all. Uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, a, a, a theory which shows that there is no God, as I've explained earlier. But it, it, does, it is a theory which I think convincingly explains something remarkable, which is how um, from... Uh, uh, a world with no life uh, we've come to a world which is, is, is full of life and not only that but full of very complex life full of life that asks questions about itself and about its place in the cosmos and about how the cosmos works about whether there's a God and the nature of God and so on. That's a remarkable thing and uh, the theory of evolution does show how this can come about so if, if uh, a purely physical theory can show something so remarkable, something which seems on the face of it so difficult to explain, then I think, well, maybe the other things that science hasn't explained yet can also be explained by physical theories too. So for that reason, I don't see any uh, 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 reason looking around this, this remarkable, amazing, <coughs> endlessly fascinating cosmos to think from that, oh, there must be a designer. Um, Well, uh, turning to the, the problem of evil, um, um, uh, yes, uh, 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 say how can uh, how can, can evil exist in the world? And, and uh, Hamza says, well, look, the idea of, of evil comes from from God anyway, um, which takes us back to the idea of, of God as the the source of, of moral value. Um, uh, Hamza said a little while ago, um, uh, in response to the uh, the. Uh, Plato's dilemma, which uh, I raised earlier, um, I said, uh, isn't that good because God commands it, or does he command it because it's good? And Hamza says, well, the, the answer to that dilemma is that God is good. So therefore, God would only command you to do good things because God is good. But I, I'd like to ask uh, Hamza, um, when you say that God is good, by what standard of good are you judging him? Surely then you are judging him by an external standard. So therefore, you're saying that it's not just that God defines good, but that God is, is, is good by some external standard. And if God is good by some external standard, then we can relate our own morality to that external standard, and we don't need to get our morality from God. And therefore, because it's an external standard, we can also say that some things are, are, are evil. Um, the, 
Evil is a tricky word because when we, we talk about things being evil, we normally talk about, we're talking about uh, not like volcanoes going off and tsunamis, we're talking about the actions of, of human beings. And uh, uh, the, the, the question was raised, uh, well, why would a good God create uh, Hitler? Um, I, I think that the, I'd call it the problem of suffering is a, is a, is a real problem for uh, Christianity and for Islam. Um, how could a merciful God allow so much suffering from natural causes um, uh, unless um, uh, the, uh, the victims are compensated in an afterlife, which as an agnostic I don't believe in anyway, so that's not a compelling argument for me. Um, maybe if you have a previously existing uh, a belief in, 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 in the afterlife, then maybe it's a sufficient uh, uh, answer to you for the, the problem of suffering, or, or the, I'd, I'd have doubts myself. Um, but the, the problem of evil, the, the problem of people doing nasty things to each other, in fact, the people, problem of people doing awful, appalling things to one another, they say, why doesn't God stop that? That doesn't seem like an argument necessarily against the existence of God for me, because you could have uh, a God who decided to create us with free will and um, decided that uh, this was overall the best thing to do, um, and having given us free will, had bound himself or was bound by logic um, from interfering with that free will, and therefore had to stand by and watch as we did awful things to one another. So I don't, I don't find that a great argument against the existence of God. But I do think that the the problem of of, of, of suffering from natural causes, like tsunamis, is is a, is a compelling argument. Okay, thank you very much. We'll just take a couple more questions and Hamza's and Rick's responses to them, and then I shall invite the two speakers to sum up. And I've already seen enough hands go up. There's a lady up against the wall. Yes, just there. Okay, hi, my name is Zainab. As an agnostic, I'm assuming you don't actually believe in the hereafter, therefore you don't have, like not in a rude way at all, but you don't have any set morals. All your morals are set by society. For an example of this would be homosexuality, where 56 years ago it was really frowned upon and now everyone's fighting for their equal rights. Um, so the morals of society is constantly changing. How do you set yourself limits? And if you do, why? If you're never going to get rewarded or punished for anything, other than yourself, you have no purpose in this life. Okay, thank you. And then there's, uh, if you come down to about the fifth row, there's a list. Yes, thank you. Um, my name's Nozomi and I'm a music student and um, I guess to me the argument is that over time people's kind of like, you know, uh, philosophies and minds change as well and books like these, these ancient religious books, you can't read it and take it exactly as they are. That, that's my argument. And my question is, if the universe needs an explanation, then why does um, God, I mean, um, if the universe needs an explanation, then why, why can God not have an explanation and just be God? Why must you have to explain the universe but not have to explain God? I just don't understand it, so I'd like to have that answer. Okay, thank you very much. We'll just take these two before the speakers do something else. Rick, how do you set your limits? And probably more one for Hamza, what's this, this conflict between what needs an explanation and what doesn't? So. Well, you, you, you can't live without uh, morality. You, you, you have to uh, have uh, limits. Uh, what exactly those limits should be? Um, you, 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 have to, you have to work out for yourself. Um, and uh, each of us attempts to do that in our own way. Um, I believe we're, we're responsible um, for our actions and also for the consequences of those actions as far as we can see them. Um, I believe we should uh, avoid um, inflicting suffering on one another and uh, that uh, uh, we should treat one another honestly as far as possible. Um, um, uh, <laughs> it's, it's such a big subject I hardly know where to start. It's, it's something that's absorbed me for years. Um, I'm so sorry I can't sum it up more, more succinctly than that. Um, okay. Yeah. okay, thanks very much. And then one for you, Hamza, this question of why does the universe need an explanation and God not? Can I address the first question as well? Yes, of course. 
Okay, I, 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 I agree with the system which is talking about then who draws the line and where because it is very important because we do have this shifting kind of morality based upon social pressures and, and this is the problem um, that's why I said that God is the only conceptual anchor that transcends human subjectivity and Rick replied then you're saying God is good to deal with the dilemma but the issue here then goes into more of a deeper philosophical question of you know, we believe also in the theological aspect of revelation. It teaches us about this thing called fitra. We have an innate goodness in us. Uh, so we understand goodness. But sometimes we could be skewed and our instincts are deviated and our, and our moral pathways that are inbuilt in us can be deviated. So therefore, we will require epistemology. Quran, what does it say about life, man, and the universe? So there is a base morality, but then you have to elevate it. And there's other like gray areas. For example, if you read literature, Literature was designed, in my opinion, just to grey moral boundaries. You know, and, uh, I, do you see my point? And that's why we always have this kind of understanding of, you know, what do we do and how, and how do we do things. So, God solves the problem by Him being the conceptual anchor that transcends human subjectivity. Now, the other lady, the media student that was saying that philosophy changes, I mean, I don't know if that's an argument against God, it's not. I mean, because sometimes it could change for the better or it could change for the worse. Um, also, you're saying, why does the universe need an explanation? Uh, when you're saying God doesn't need an explanation, well, if you were intended to my argument, I said, you know, God doesn't, I'm not saying the universe needs an explanation. What I'm saying is, is when I reflect upon certain evidences in the universe, then I come with a certain conclusion. It's not based upon this thing that I need answers. You know, I came, I grew up in a very humanist, philosophical, spiritual type of family. Um, my dad's like a humanist, spiritualist, if you like, yeah? Very nice man, just like Rick is a very nice man, in my opinion. And I'm not saying that patronizing, I think this is you know, very conducive, a very amazing debate. You don't have this. And I think you know, uh, we should be proud of the fact that we've sat here and we've had a very calm and positive discussion. Um, so I thank Rick for that and everybody else, of course. Um, now, you know, you know, it's not this primitive thing that you always want answers, and I didn't come from that background either. I thought I had all the answers, but when evidence came across to me, I just inferred and deduced from evidence and came to a certain conclusion. It wasn't based upon the fact that people who have religion, they just don't have the answers, that's why they're like that. And I think that's a very outdated cliche in my, in my opinion, you know. And you also referred to about uh, <coughs> revelation, you know, why would we believe in a book that's 1400 years old? I mean, maybe if you were to read the books, then you could come to a better more conclusion. Uh, I would argue that you probably haven't read the book in the first place. Uh, because if you have, you would see that the Quran has a solution to both poverty. It has an ideological solution to poverty. I mean, you know, it doesn't stop at saying, love thy neighbor. I mean, what does that mean? It doesn't get you far. What does love mean? And what does neighbor mean? And how do you have mechanisms to implement those values? And the unique thing about Islam and the Quran is that not only it's a set of values, but it's a set of mechanisms that implements those values too. So in regards to like the poverty question, instead of having this geopolitical myth, this liberal economic myth, that basically there's not enough, there's not enough resources and there's not enough needs and therefore there's competition, Islam says totally something different, which says, no, there's limited needs and enough resources. So instead of competition, it creates this macroeconomy of distribution and from that we have mechanisms such as the zakat system and other things that improve it and this is a challenge to the humanists because the humanists say we don't need religion because when did religion get something that was already human and make it better well some religions didn't but one religion that did make something better was actually giving charity it socialized it politicized it made it into an institution made it into an economic model and in the words of many historians, actually for the first time on a state level, when Islamic governance was in power, there was no one that was poor. Everyone had food, shelter, and clothing. I, th I think that's an amazing thing. So in response, maybe you should read the Quran. Yeah. <laughs> okay, th thank you very much for that. I'm now going to inspire, invite each speaker to spend just two minutes, we like on time strictly, <laughs> summing up and perhaps in particular saying what they've learned from this evening. Hamza. Okay, I think it's been a very interesting discussion. In summary, my arguments were whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And my other argument was the fine-tuning of the universe can be explained by chance, 
physical necessity of design, it can't be chance or physical necessity, therefore it's design. I think some of the responses were useful questions, but they weren't counted as philosophical defeaters of my argument. And especially when we went into the argument of nothingness, you know, it's quite interesting because there's more evidence to believe that nothing comes out of nothing rather than something comes out of nothing. So, as David Hume said, who was an atheist, said, why don't you just take the greater evidence? And we always want to grasp our intellectual straws and throw God out of the window. But in actual fact, when we're doing that, we're throwing our intellect out of the window because, you know, as I said, there's more reasons to believe that nothing comes out of nothing rather than something comes out of nothing. Uh, and, you know, I think what's useful with the problem of evil argument, I don't think there was an adequate response in my opinion, because, you know, we have concept of a first order good and a second order good and a first order evil and a second order <coughs> evil. And sometimes evil acts make us have a second order good. For example, when there's cowardice in society, the only way to appreciate courage is by having an element of the first order evil of cowardice. So you have a higher good, which is having courage. Uh, similarly with pain, we won't be able to know God. And in Islam, we believe God is the healer. How would you know God is, is the healer if you weren't in pain in the first place? And we believe that knowing God is more important than pain or suffering anyway. Because the question presumes that you're here just to have a nice time. We don't believe that in Islam. We're here to know and love God. Which in my opinion, I would have a lot of pain for that. Uh, because it's something that's transcendental, something very deep and spiritual. And that's why the problem of evil is a very materialistic argument. Now, what I've learned from today's discussion, I have to admit that this is the first of many debates I've had with an agnostic or atheist that has been, I've learned so much. And not only from his amazing behavior, not to say that all oh, atheists behave badly, of course. <laughs> well, th well, then we go into the objective morality again, you know, what is good. No, but that's not the point. The point is this has been conducive to positive discussion. We should continue that way. And I think he would agree with me that we need to transcend the dogmatic atheism of Hitchens and Dawkins and come to a very nuanced discussion because now is the time for change. And I'm not trying to sound like Obama, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe I have this smile. Um, so the issue is now is really the time for change because we need to transcend outdated cliches and the rhetoric and come together on the table and have a nuanced discussion, even if we disagree with each other. So that's why I commend Dialogue with Islam and all the other organizers that facilitate today's event because what I learned was is, I need to probably read a little bit more as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, all right. Um, uh, well, I, I'd like to agree with a lot of what Hamza said about uh, the need for dialogue um, and, uh, and the fantastic work which Dialogue with Islam is, is doing. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, many of you were expecting before the debate that uh, I'd be, uh, because of the title of the debate, maybe um, uh, putting forward the same kind of arguments as Dawkins and coming up with eight knockdown arguments which absolutely prove the non-existence of God. I don't have such arguments. If I had any for you, I, I would have given them to you. Um, and yet I, I haven't come across any argument, even in this absolutely fascinating and informative uh, debate, with uh, excellent uh, um, arguments put forward by Hamza and, uh, and also the, the fascinating questions which you, you raised. I haven't come across any argument to convince me that God exists. And I've seen no evidence in the world that could only be explained by God's existence. However, I'm an agnostic, not an atheist, for two reasons. Firstly, I've also seen nothing in the world which is utterly incompatible with the existence of a certain type of God. Not, I'd have to say, the God of Islam or Christianity, but of a God who creates the rules of the universe and then binds himself voluntarily or is bound by logic from interfering with the running of the universe. There could be such a God. Um, William of Ockham said that we shouldn't multiply entities beyond necessity. If we don't have a need for such a God in our explanation, why introduce God into our worldview? Uh, I, I go along with that, and so I'm, I'm living my life on the assumption that there isn't a God. But Occam's razor isn't, isn't actually a disproof of God. You know, they, they, it's, it's, it's possible that there, there is a God. It's compatible with what we see, at least. A God of that sort, I think. Um, the second reason I'm an agnostic rather than an atheist is that I recognize that our reason is limited compared with the awesome complexity of the universe in which we find ourselves. And... I could be wrong about my assessment of the arguments which are put forward. Um, the, the most fascinating thing that came up in the discussion, of course, was, was the, the, the question of morality, I think. 
Um, I already said I think there are problems anyway with deriving morality from the existence of, 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 of God. Um, but without God, then what do we do to, to base our, our, our morality? Um, I think it's absolutely uh, a, a pressing question. It's not one that can be answered by society. It's one that has to be answered by each of us individually. We have to find a way to get along. It's not a question you can find a way around. Um, and, and, but it, I believe it's the, that's the, the start of a, a, a very long and interesting debate, not the end of one. I think it went pretty well. I was especially pleased that the audience participated, they stuck to the points, they gave well-focused questions, and we got pretty decent answers from the speakers as well. I mean, to me that's the important thing about it, that we do have a good dialogue and involve everybody. And do you think that events like this should continue in the future, with like uh, mixed faith uh, groups and trying to debate about topics such as these? Definitely. I think it's incredibly important that you do keep the dialogue going and that we don't fall into our own little cells in which we don't know what other people are doing. And especially important is that we realise that although we know where we stand, we recognise there's another point of view and that we, or the other people, might be mistaken. And are you going to be in involved in any upcoming events such as this? I'd, I'd be very happy to, yes. Either as a chair or as a speaker. Okay, that's it. So how do you think today's event went? I think it was a very interesting and successful uh, event today, uh, um, at least from my point of view, because I, I, I learned a lot. Um, I had a few of my assumptions challenged. Um, uh, I didn't hear anything that completely changed my mind about uh, the existence of God, but uh, I certainly have found a lot of things to make me think. So do you think we should have more events like this in the future? I hope you have a lot more events like this in the future, because uh, I, I think that they're they're great learning experiences. Uh, it's great to interact with uh, all these other people who are interested in the same sorts of questions, uh, passionately interested in some cases. And uh, I, I really think it's mentally stimulating and, uh, um, and challenging. I think the event went really, really well. It shows that Islam has a position, has an argument, has a cogent argument for the existence of God and many other questions that came out in today's debate with intellectuals and academics. You know, gone are the days that we could use outdated cliches that religion is barbaric, backwards and wrong. You know, we should transcend the likes of Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and really get into the grips of arguments and start to learn them and, and promulgate them in the public square like we've done today. Similarly, what was very interesting was my last point, I think, which was there's greater reasons to believe that something comes out of something rather than something comes out of nothing. So why do we really grasp our intellectual straws and believe that something came out of nothing? So I think generally the debate was very successful and I thank Rick Lewis and everyone that organized the debate today. If I could ask a question um, to one of the speakers, it probably would be to Rick Lewis. Um, what got me is that he said that, clearly mentioned that he wasn't an atheist, but he was an agnostic. Uh, so my question would basically be, if he is an agnostic um, and that he doesn't overrule God being in existence, then wouldn't it be, be safer on his part for the hereafter to believe in God anyway? And then taking that route of what would be the most convincing evidences and proofs to which course of life God would like him to live. Uh, because then um, it would have been a much better way to live as Hamza already proved that having a religion in someone's life is better in regards to living. Um, and like our, my thoughts would be that it will be on his uh, benefit rather than uh, anyone else's in regards to the hereafter. I think this is one up from a starting block. I think the arguments that are brought forward by writers such as uh, Dawkins uh, and, and, his, and his ilk uh, recently have got a lot of publicity, but actually when you look at their arguments they carry very little weight. Actually the arguments proposed today by the agnostics here or by the philosophers were stronger than their arguments uh, and I think that we should move forward, as I said, confidently. People like Hamza are doing an excellent job in bringing the Islamic perspective and I think that it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually, from the other side, from the, vo from the v view of the humanists or the atheists, they're going to have to step up their game now.